started. Now the Louisiana Department of Education is asking that the class of 2021 submit the free application for federal student aid. This is a requirement for uh, Louisiana public school students, and I'm not sure what um, requirements um, have been put in place on your campus, but it's always a good idea to make sure that your student is prepared for college in the fall. And because it can be expensive, um, we need to start preparing for it and identify some of those costs because when you go to your college websites um, you're going to find that most often their tuition is listed but not always the additional fees and expenses so let me mention this too as well as we're getting started if everybody will um, turn off their video and mute themselves then we won't be a distraction to each other. Thanks. So some of these expenses are um, going to include your equipment, books and supplies like textbooks, your notebooks, a computer if you need one. Personal expenses like your phone bill, fuel for your car to get back and forth to campus and any food purchases outside of your meal plan your room and board, which could include your um, dorm room or an apartment if you're living off campus, and then tuition and fees. So your fees are going to include your parking, library, technology, athletic fees, and then college tra and campus transportation if you need that. But the good news is that financial aid is available from the U.S. Department of Education, the state of Louisiana, your college or career school, and then nonprofit and private organizations. And every year, the federal government provides more than $120 billion in student financial aid. If you don't mind, I see something already in the chat box, which reminds me. Yes, we've already gotten started, Lisa, so I hope you can hear me and you can see the presentation. But this reminds me, as we're moving through this material, if you have a question, just drop it down there in the Zoom chat box and we will discuss it afterwards. Now, every year, the um, U.S. Department of Education awards over $120 billion in student financial aid, and we just want to make sure that you are uh, receiving your portion of that aid, which includes the federal Pell Grant, the federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, the Teacher Educational Assistance for College and Higher Education Grant, the Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, federal work study, and then direct subsidized, unsubsidized, and plus loans. Now, federal student aid grants are a form of financial aid that does not have to be repaid, so you never want to turn down a grant offer from a college. The Pell Grants are for undergraduates with financial need, the FSEOGs are for undergraduates with exceptional financial need. And then the service grants are for students of military parents who died defending the country following 9-11. There's also a TEACH grant for students who are pursuing a teaching career. Now the Federal Work Study Program provides part-time jobs to students to help pay for their <laughs> education expenses. <coughs> So when you tell the financial aid office that you're interested in federal work study, they're going to consider you for this program. <laughs> they will begin to identify jobs on campus that you might be eligible for. Hold on, we're still admitting students. Now the monies that you make through federal work study jobs go directly to the student and should be used for their miscellaneous college expenses. This is a FAFSA question. 
and we encourage all students to select yes, I'm interested in federal work study because it does not obligate you to take the positions. But if you do, these jobs look great on your first professional resume. Now, let's touch on the student loans and no one wants to have to borrow for their, whether it's for their education or not. But if you cannot complete your college degree without the assistance of some loans, um, then they're, they are a good investment. The direct subsidized loans are based on financial need and no interest is charged on this type of loan until you graduate or cease to attend. The unsubsidized loan, on the other hand, is um, available for almost everyone, regardless of their financial need. But with this type of loan, it's important to note that interest does begin to accrue once this loan is fully dispersed and then throughout the life of the loan. So you can see that there is a big difference between the direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans. You always want to accept the subsidized loan portion first. And you can remind yourself of this when you receive your financial aid offers by telling yourself that the U in unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest on this type of loan. Now, if you are offered loans and you do need them to complete your academic year, you want to accept the federal student loans first because payments aren't due until you graduate or cease to attend. The interest rate is fixed at a lower rate and no credit check is required. These loans are in the student's name and their built students are also building credit while they're in school. Now, the private loans, on the other hand, should be accepted only as needed because most are going to require that payments be made while you're still in school. The interest rate is often much higher and they almost always require a co-signance. So make sure you're doing your research if you are accepting private student loans um, because you're going to find that the interest rates are going to vary and the incentives to borrow will as well. So to dispel the myth, almost everyone is eligible for some type of federal student aid. All federal student aid and most institutional and private aid is contingent upon completion of the FAFSA. The FAFSA launched on October 1st, and hopefully many of you have already completed your financial aid application. It's important to note that this form must be filled out every year that the student is going to be in college and that student financial aid is awarded on a first come first served basis. So you want to get your FAFSA completed as soon as you can, because we've already been alerted that more than 1 million FAFSAs have already been submitted for next academic year. So get to the head of that line while the money is still available so you'll be offered the maximum award that you're eligible to receive. And remember to pay very close attention to the deadlines. There will be college financial aid deadlines. The state has a deadline as far as the top scholarship goes. And yes, the FAFSA is one of the forms of application for the top scholarship and they do have a FAFSA deadline. And then federal student aid has a deadline as well. But you want to begin the FAFSA process by collect collecting all of the documents that you need to complete. If you do this before you get started, it should take you anywhere between 20 and 40 minutes to complete the FAFSA. And those documents include the student and parents social security cards, the student and parents 2019 federal income tax returns if you filed, your W-2s because there's information on this form that might not be found on the tax return itself, and then bank statements and records of investments. 
because you must report the balances of these accounts as of the date you submit the FAFSA. Now you're going to want to begin the FAFSA process by creating your federal student aid ID. This is a unique username and password that you're going to create and it should reflect only your personal information. Each student and one of his parents should create the ID by visiting fsaid.ed.gov. Now, only your email address, your personal email address should be used on this application. Because students, once you graduate, um, if you use your school email address to create your ID, Federal Student Aid will have no way of getting in touch with you. Now, don't share information with your parents. Um, so if you, if when you're asked for, say, um, an alternate phone number, please don't use a parent's mobile phone number because if they use it in their FSA ID and you've listed it in yours, that's going to cause problems signing your FAFSA. So there should be no shared information. If you don't have an alternate phone number, go ahead and just leave that field blank. Now your FSA ID is legally binding. It's your electronic signature um, to sign all of your federal student aid documents. So you'll want to record it and keep it in a very safe place. You're going to need this ID every year that you're in college. If you don't have access to a computer when you get started on the FAFSA, you can download the mobile app. It's called My Student Aid, and it's very easy to use to submit your FAFSA on your mobile phone or any other device that has internet access. Or if you prefer, you can complete it on the web-based version at FAFSA.gov. Now, if the student wants to begin the form on his mobile phone or device, and mom or dad wants to use the web-based version, that's fine. Everything will be integrated. Um, and when it's time to sign and submit, you can do so on either the mobile app or the web-based version. You'll want to begin the FAFSA by logging in with the student's FSA ID because the FAFSA is the student's application for federal student aid. Now, mom or dad, the F, your FSA ID is going to be used a little bit later in the form if you choose to transfer your information from the IRS into the FAFSA and then again to sign your child's FAFSA. It's important to remember that the class of 2021 should complete the 2021 2022 FAFSA because that's the academic year that you're applying for financial aid if you're beginning next fall. Now, if you're planning to start college early, you may have to complete two FAFSAs. Contact your financial aid office to find out if that's the case in your situation. Once you get further into the form, you're going to find that there are eight sections that need to be completed before you submit. You'll start out in the student demographic section where the student will report his social security number, name, date of birth, email address, physical address, residency status, and gender. You'll move to the school selection section where you will report the name of your high school, the colleges that you want your FAFSA data to be sent to, and your housing plans on each of those campuses. Next is the dependency status section. And this is where the student will be asked to consider a list of 10 questions that will determine your dependency status, which we're gonna talk a little bit later about. The number of dependents living in the student's household will be reported in this section along with the parent's education. And often parents want to know why they're being asked to report their level of education. But it is important to know that there could be additional student financial aid for first generation college students. Now, the parent demographics, um, the questions here in this section should be answered by the parents. 
um, where they will report their social security numbers, their marital status, and their email address. Then you're going to move over into the parent and student financials, where you will both report your working wages from 2019, if any, any federal benefits you receive, and the balances of your savings and investment accounts. And then it's almost time to sign and submit. But for tonight, I'm just going to go over the most commonly asked FAFSA questions. And one that we're often asked is about the citizenship requirement. And it's important to note that a student must be a citizen or an eligible non-citizen to complete a FAFSA. However, if the parents are, are not either citizens nor eligible non-citizens, the student can still submit, but they will use zeros anywhere a social security number is asked of the parent. Now, young men between the ages of 18 and 28 must be registered with Selective Service to receive federal student aid or really any federal benefits. So if you haven't already done so, guys, now is your chance. Um, even if you haven't turned 18 yet, you can select Register Me within the FAFSA. And once you turn 18, you will be automatically registered with Selective Service. Only the colleges that you list on your FAFSA are going to consider you for student financial aid. They're not just going to send out all your personal and financial information to every college across the country. You must give them permission. So add all of the schools that you're considering. Even if you haven't finished your admissions application, Go ahead and get your, fina your financial aid information over to them. And you can add up to 10 colleges each time you submit your FAFSA. Now, if you're planning to apply to more than 10 colleges, then there are instructions on this page to do that. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the dependency status of the student. This is where a student will be will be identified as dependent or independent and whether the student must provide parental information or not. So these are the 10 questions that the student will be asked to consider and I'll go over them quickly. Will the student be 24 or older by January 1 of the school year for which he's applying for financial aid? Is he married or separated but not divorced? Will he be working on a graduate degree? Will he have children who receive more than half of their support from him? Does he have dependents other than children or a spouse who live with him and receive more than half of their support from him? Is he currently serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces for purposes other than training? So those of you who are going straight into the military Boot camps and basic training are considered training. So that student will still be considered dependent. Is the student a veteran of the US Armed Forces? At any time since he turned 13, were both of his parents deceased? Was he in foster care? Or was he a ward or a dependent of the court? Is he an, an emancipated minor? Or is he in legal guardianship as determined by a court? Now, it's important to note that legal custody is not always considered legal guardianship. So have your legal documentation ready as you answer that question. Is the student an unaccompanied youth who is homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? If a student can answer yes to just one of these questions and provide a legal document supporting that claim, if he is considered an independent student for FAFSA purposes and will not be required to provide parental information. But for FAFSA purposes, a student is not considered an independent student if simply because he files his own taxes or he lives alone and supports himself. He must be able to answer one of the prior 10 questions. 
And the number one, one question that we're asked is, Okay. Which parents do I report or on that? Go play Pokemon. Oh, I'm sorry. On? I think somebody is still unmuted. If you don't mind muting your speaker. I don't know if I can't. I don't know if we have a year of contract or what it is, but now I got to go. I need Hold on just a minute. I'm going to see if I can. We signed I'm out. Like, so okay. Somebody's muted. All right. Okay, I think everybody's unmuted. So the rule of thumb when it comes to reporting your parents is that uh, you will report the parents that you lived with the longest in the past 12 months on your FAFSA. So if you live with both of your biological parents, then you want to list both of them. But if the parent that you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is either separated divorced or was never married, then you should list only that parent on the FAFSA. Unless that parent has remarried, then you must also list that step parent. In other words, federal student aid wants to know the financial standing of the, of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the 12 months prior to the date that the FAFSA was submitted. Now, if you are an independent, if you are identified as a dependent student, but your parents refuse to provide their information on your FAFSA, you can submit it by stating, I'm un unable to provide information about my parents. But please be aware that you are only going to be considered for federal student loans. You will not be offered any uh, grant monies. So if you find yourself in this situation and your parents will not comply, please contact your college financial aid office. They can work with you to determine if there's any remedy to this problem. Now to make the financial aid process go a lot smoother, um, it's very important that you use the Internal Revenue Services Data Retrieval Tool. This will take you directly into the IRS website where you can grab your tax information from 2019 and populate it into your FAFSA. This makes it quicker and allows for fewer errors and greatly diminishes the student's um, chances of being selected for verification. But I will tell you, this is where your 2019 tax return comes into play. There have been situations where we have seen where a tax preparer has either misspelled um, a student or parent's name on the tax return, they've entered the wrong address, they may have used street instead of avenue, regardless of whether you've moved since 2019, you must get your 2019 return and make sure that everything printed on that return is entered into these fields. That's the only way you can successfully use the tool. If you're having trouble, please contact Federal Student Aid or give us a call at Leela's FAFSA Helpline and we'll be happy to walk you through the process. If you choose not to use the tool, which is your choice, you will be asked by the financial aid office at each of the colleges you're applying to, to go to the IRS, request a tax transcript from that tax year and send it directly to the college. So save yourself some time um, and use the tool if you can. And then you're almost finished with the FAFSA, but please review the student aid report before you sign and submit this report is going to show you every question you were asked on the FAFSA and each of your answers. And now is the time to make sure that everything is correct. You want um, correct information being sent over to the financial aid office so that they can timely process the student's financial aid. Then you move on into the sign and submit section. 
where you can see the student is asked to provide his electronic signature or FSA ID. Then the parent will be asked to sign with his FSA ID. Remember, only one parent must sign and the parent who created the ID will sign at this time. And once you do, a confirmation page will pop up on your screen. Now, I'll encourage you to print this page or take a screenshot of it because although the student will receive an email from Federal Student Aid telling them that they have successfully submitted, this is the only time you're going to see this much detail. You'll have the date and time you submitted. You'll see the what happens next in the student financial aid process. You will see a list of the colleges listed in your FAFSA that are going to receive your data, and you'll be able to consider your financial aid estimates. And remember that these are only estimates. Federal student aid does not award the students financial aid. That is the job for the college financial aid offices. Now, if you begin a FAFSA without completing it, or you submit a FAFSA um, that needs additional attention, maybe it doesn't have close signatures, then you will receive a reminder from Federal Student Aid telling you that further action needs to be taken. Now, mom and dad, this email is going to go directly to the student's email. They'll never contact you personally, unless you're a student also. Um, so make sure that you're encouraging your student to check the emails timely and to communicate that information to you as well. Now, what if you want to add a school or you want to change your contact information or say you want to add a college or your college has asked you to make corrections? You can do that in a variety of ways. You can um, contact them by mail. You can um, ask your college financial aid office to make those corrections for you. But the quickest way is to go to FAFSA.gov, log in, make your corrections and additions. But each time you do, remember that you must sign and submit your FAFSA again. Now, once your FAFSA is fully processed, at that time, it's shared with your colleges, and they will begin to identify any aid that you might be eligible to receive. Now, if your family's financial situation has changed since you filed your return in 2019, and unfortunately, I think we're going to see a lot of this, not only around the country, but specifically in Louisiana with all the storms we've had blowing through here this hurricane season, please contact your financial aid office because they may have additional uh, financial support for the student. They have the ability to adjust your aid by using their own professional judgment. So say that one or both parents have been laid off or had a reduction in work hours. The student may have lost their part-time job. There may be increased um, unexpected medical expenses incurred. It's your responsibility to contact the financial aid office. They're not going to offer assistance to you, so don't be shy about contacting them because they are working to determine the net price for the student. And they're going to do this by taking the cost of attendance on their campus and subtracting any grants or scholarships that your child might be eligible to receive. And this is going to determine the student's net price, which must be paid before the student can continue on into that first semester. Now, each student, uh, the student will receive a financial aid offer from each college listed on the FAFSA. Most colleges are waiting for the student to complete the admissions process. So they'll hold on to your FAFSA data until you complete uh, your application for admissions. So make sure you're getting those done in a timely fashion as well. But every college will send an offer. That offer will show the cost of attendance there on their campus. It will line item any grants 
scholarship, work study, or student loans that, the, that they've identified the student to be eligible to receive. So make sure that you're reviewing each award offer carefully and that you're responding to any requests from the financial aid office so that they can process this um, timely. Once you do make your decision on your college, you want to accept your financial aid in this order. Grants and scholarships, then federal work study, and then your student loans. Now, I know this is a lot of information. Um, so every year, Leela provides a and publishes a FAFSA completion guide. We have done so again for the class of 2021 and it's free for all Louisiana high school seniors. So if you haven't already received one, please feel free to send me an email. I'll provide that email address for you at the end of the presentation, um, and I'll be happy to send that to you, along with our senior checklist to help you stay on track and be ready for college in the fall. Now, I know you know all about scholarships and what they are, but just as a reminder, you can find them um, at your college, you can find them, perhaps your, um, your parents' employers offer scholarships. Um, they're offered by community and religious organizations. Some are merit-based, awarded on academic achievement, and some are based on financial need. Some are going to cover the entire cost of your tuition, and others might be a one-time award. But the bottom line is applying and receiving scholarships is going to help reduce the cost of your education and therefore reduce your student loan debt. Now, talk to your high school counselor about these. Call the financial aid office to ask them what kind of scholarships they've seen coming um, into their office. And also talk to your um, admissions recruiters. This year, Leela is offering a $1,000 FAFSA completion scholarship, and it's for all Louisiana high school seniors. Um, you can find information about it at leela.org. And then once you're in college, or if you have older siblings that are already in college, uh, those who are attending a Louisiana college can apply for our Choose Louisiana scholarship. The, uh, information about both of these scholarships and the applications can be found at leela.org. For students who are applying to pricier colleges, if you need additional funding after you have um, exhausted all your opportunities for grants, scholarships, and your federal and state dollars, Leela does administer a nonprofit education loan program. It's called Leela Choice, and you can find the details at leelachoice.org. So now is the time to begin dropping your questions into the chat box if you have them, and I'll be happy to address those. And as we're doing that, as I'm checking the chat box, I'm going to encourage you to jot down our um, FAFSA helpline number and my email address if you want to talk to me individually after this evening's presentation, which, by the way, is going to be posted on our YouTube channel called Ask Leela, and I'll also be sending a copy of the recording to your counselor. So please feel free to review it again or share it with somebody who couldn't attend tonight. Okay. Hi, Ms. Langston. She says that one of her students received a Pell Grant refund and that he can use the money for college or for anything that he wants. Is that true? So if a student is eligible for a Pell Grant, but say they also received some other scholarships so that there is a credit in that student's account, that student can withdraw that money, even if it's additional Pell money, and he can use it to pay for his college expenses. 
Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say he can use it for anything that he wants, but as you um, noted, there are a lot of expenses that are covered. So if a student needs to purchase a car to drive back and forth to campus, he can use his money to pay his um, auto loan or his insurance, or if he is um, having to take a, a bus back and forth to school, all those types of expenses are covered. So I wouldn't put it as like, ah, they can use it for anything, but uh, you pretty much can use it for a majority of the expenses that help you complete your college career. Okay, so here's the clarification, requesting clarification. Do you apply to the colleges first or do you complete the FAFSA first? I always encourage parents to complete the FAFSA the very first day, October 1st, because these monies are available on college campuses. They are lump sums of money that are given to colleges all over the country. And depending upon the students that are applying to a specific college, they could run out of the grant money first. This year, we're gonna see that quite a few more parents and students are going to be requesting grant money because they've lost their jobs, they have medical expenses, uh, Pell adjustments are gonna be made on the college campuses. So those students who completed their FAFSA first and you have that confirmation page showing the date and time you submitted your FAFSA, that financial aid is going to be processed in order. So make sure you're applying as soon as possible. It's definitely important to get your admissions applications done too. So you have a, quite a lot of work ahead of you all. All right, here's someone who says, I have an FSA ID for my daughter that's already in college. Do I need a separate one for my son? And that's a great question. So I'm assuming you mean you personally have an FSA ID that you used to sign your daughter's FAFSA last year. Your FAFSA is yours for life, so of your FSA ID. So if you created an FSA ID last year or five years ago, or when you were in college, then you use that FSA ID every time you go to a federal student aid website, and that includes the FAFSA. So nope, yours will stay the same, and this son who's graduating this year will create a brand new FSA ID. Okay, this is a good question. Some of the scholarships are asking for a student aid report to be sent. It's related to the FAFSA, and that's right. And you know, uh, remember when I mentioned that before you sign and submit, you can print out a copy of that student aid report, do it then. But also, if you've already completed the process and you want to go and pull a copy of that student aid report, go to fafsa.gov and there's a hyperlink on that home page that says, view my student aid report. Click there, a copy of your student aid report will pop up, print it, and send it on with your scholarship application. These are some great questions. Are there any others? Well, I hope that each of you will get your FAFSA done as soon as possible and apply for our $1,000 scholarship for students who have done so. I'll be reviewing all of those applications. They're really sim simple to uh, complete, probably the easiest scholarship app you're going to um, complete. Um, no essay is required, so make sure you're doing that. And also, don't hesitate to call me if you have a FAFSA question, if you want me to stay on the line when you're completing your FAFSA, if you're having trouble signing, um, I'm always here to help you. I'll wait just about 30 more seconds, and if I don't receive another question, I'll go ahead and sign off for the evening. Oh, here's one. If we decide to pay out of pocket, do we go through all of this? That's often asked. 
parents will say, I know my child is not going to be eligible eligible for Pell. And most most aren't because it is a need-based um, award. However, a lot of colleges use that FAFSA to identify institutional aid. So there may be some scholarships on campus that could be awarded to your child, but they may not know that you're interested in receiving that money because you didn't submit a FAFSA. So that FAFSA is just like a trigger to the financial aid office to start looking around for anything that your child might be eligible for, anything they can offer you to go to their school. And that's kind of how they look at it. They're recruiting your, your kids and the financial aid office's job is to make sure they provide all of the money um, in the um, form of an offer to you to attend their college. It's your choice. Um, but that's, that's how I'll answer that question. You guys have been a great audience and I appreciate you being here tonight. I want to say another shout out to Miss Langston, my old friend. It was great to see you here and I look forward to working with each of you in the future. Good night.